Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm John. I'm alcoholic. I'd like to thank Wayne, uh, Wayne for asking me to speak tonight. I'm very grateful to be up here. Uh, it, it is an honor. Um, just uh, started drinking when I was 15. Um, grew up outside of New York. And uh, alcohol did for me what it talks about in the Promises in the Ninth Step, page 83, 84. I knew a new freedom and a new happiness. I didn't regret the past. I certainly thought everything I had to say could help others. Um, alcohol lit me up. It lit me up from the very first time I got buzzed. I loved it. Um, it made me feel cool. It made me feel interesting. It made me feel like somebody I wanted to be around. And uh, I don't know if there's anything particularly wrong with me as a child. I don't really think there was. I just loved alcohol. I loved the way it made me feel. Um, so I, I was a binge drinker through my late teens. Didn't ever really get into a lot of trouble. Uh, my drinking accelerated in my 20s. And it got bad, and we all sort of know what that looks like when it gets bad. Um, I landed in AA in New York City in February of 1999, uh, broken. And I mean, I was the kind of drinker who would sit at home uh, watching the History Channel, drinking a bottle of absolute vodka out of a chipped wine glass from the freezer, um, and popping some other prescriptions throughout that process. Uh, I came in pretty broken. Um, one, one story from that period was... Uh, I was at work, I was new at this job, I was 28, and my doctor called because I'd been having all these bizarre symptoms. And I was losing weight and I fainted and my eyesight was getting really bad. And he said, John, you're diabetic. Well, well, well the first thought was, Christ, this is going to interfere with my drinking. Um, I, I didn't think for one minute about chocolate cake, pasta, <laughs> chips. It, I thought about the interference that it would have with my vodka drinking, which is... My intent was to manage my vodka drinking for my entire life so I could manage my life over here, so I could enjoy what I really liked over here. I didn't like to, at that point, I wasn't a social drinker anymore. I was a, I was somebody who'd go out for like six or eight vodkas with friends, and then I'd go home and do my real drinking. And that was home alone in front of a TV, and that's where I liked to be. Um, so I came in in, uh, in 99. And I heard this woman with whom I had nothing in common whatsoever. She told my story. She drank the way I did. I'd never been in a place where people actually talked about things with which I completely identified. It blew my mind. Um, and I was scared. Uh, my brother had just recently died of addiction. And I was terrified that that was going to be me. Um, and so I heard people say in that in those first 90 days to work the steps. And I got a very orthodox step sponsor. Um, and he took me through the steps relatively quickly. I made my amends, did a very thorough fifth step and fourth step. Um, I began sponsoring a little bit. Um, and the first five years of my recovery were, were pretty solid. And life got good. Life began getting really good. Um, internally, I felt better. It's that internal condition, I, I think, was treated with AA and, and the steps and a god of my understanding that was in my life. Um, after five years, you know, it says back there, the great blessings that may never spoil us. Um, the blessings spoiled me to some extent, because at about six or seven years, I began, I, I kind of think, you know, I get it, I'm alcoholic, I can't drink, but do I really need to do all this stuff? Do I really need to sponsor? I mean, my primary purpose in life effectively became, number one, my job, number two, the gym, number three, making money. Number four, my partner. And if after all of those things, and it didn't matter who the partner was as long as they fit the construct that my ego liked. Um, it could have been anybody as long as they met the qualifications. That became my primary purpose. I couldn't sponsor because I flew a lot for my job and I'm very busy. And I can't do a service commitment because I'm away on the weekends in the summer. And, and I can't do this and I can't do that. And frankly, I just don't have time. And frankly, I'd rather go home and take a nap and go to the gym than go to a meeting. And that began happening at about six, six and a half years. So I became a weekend AA member, and occasionally I'd go. Uh, by year seven, I had pretty much drifted away. I'd show up once or twice a month. Um, and after about another year, it was right after my eight-year anniversary, 
I went out. I didn't go out right away on alcohol. And I mention this because alcoholism is very cunning. I knew I couldn't drink. I knew what it did to me in my 20s. Um, so I, I went out on some prescriptions, and I stayed out on those for two years. Um, and and this wasn't these weren't mild prescriptions. These were self-prescribed massive doses of narcotic pills. Um, and the dosage just kept getting higher and higher and higher. And I tried to stop, and I went back to AA. I don't think I wanted to stop. Um, I picked up a drink. It was about 10 years after I'd last had alcohol in my body. Um, and within six weeks, a month, I was back exactly to where I'd left off at the age of 28. This is 10 years later. And it was amazing to me how quickly it happened. Um, I got, I became a daily drinker very quickly. I was also doing some of the other party favors that alcoholics can sometimes engage in of a powdered variety. Um, and that was what I did for the next year. And I'd wake up some mornings in my race to the kitchen to get the vodka or the beer or the Bloody Mary or whatever I was mixing before I went to work. And I would be saying to myself as I went to that kitchen to get the alcohol, what has happened to me? What has happened to my life? I cannot believe what's become of me. Um, what happened to my recovery? I just want it back. So this weekend I'll stop. And so then I, you know, pour the giant thing of vodka. Um, and then I'd go to work. The consequences and the things I did in that period of, of three and a half years, and particularly that last year and a half when I was drinking, are really incomprehensible. It, they would have astounded me in my 20s. It was no holds barred. I was gone. I was out. Um, and I simply, I, I couldn't get back. And I wasn't really ready to get back. Now, don't ask me what ready looked like at that point, but I wasn't ready for it. Um, and the consequences began piling up. My job was going to hell. My job had always been overly important to me, never having any perspective on it. And it just became the most, it, it was astounding what happened. And there were three rehabs. There were several hospitalizations, a drink drive, a half-hearted suicide attempt. And what happened was after about a year and a half of that, this is about, call it 16 months ago, Something happened and I became willing and I knew I was going to die. And, and it was within a three week period where I had a drink drive, a suicide attempt and two hospitalizations. Um, and some people had come into my life. I was trying to get back into AA in London. And I'd met some people who, who, you know, like the book says, you know, people with a real answer. Um, and for some reason I had been beaten down so much that I became willing to hear what they were saying. And then I became willing to do what they were saying. And, what happened was I went to a treatment facility in Texas for three months that was strongly recommended to me. And uh, it was a 12-step place. And I came out of there with a pile of amend cards about that thick. Um, as soon as I got out, I started making amends. My first day out, I made amends to my parents for all the hell I put them through in that period of three and a half years. And I tore through those amends. And I got back to London. After about three and a half months, I went back to work. I began making amends at work, and they did not want to see me there. I was the guy who fell asleep in large meetings and teleconferences and didn't show up. If I showed up four days a week, it was a good week. I was usually in there about two days a week. Um, and they said to me, you know, we never got the John we hired. Um, and that stung when I was in. But, you know, I, I began just showing up and doing what I was supposed to do there. Um, as these amends went through, my sponsor said to me, you need to get some sponsees. And I said, well, in New York, we're not allowed to sponsor until we're about a year sober. Um, and he said, well, you may not have a year. Um, so I started sponsoring people. And what amazed me is I, I, I've heard people say that people who go out after a long period of continuous sobriety have a very hard time getting back. And it, it almost killed me trying to get back. And I was lucky enough to make it and blessed enough to make it. Um, but once I got back, it got better fast. And I was so willing. And I was so desperate. When they talk about the desperation of the drowning man, I had desperation I never had when I was in my early, uh, late 20s or early 30s. And I did every single thing they asked me to do. Um, and, you know, the part that really resonated with me, I heard this guy speak from a podium when I was early back this time about just about a year ago this weekend, he said the two biggest mistakes people make in AA are they underestimate the power of alcoholism and the strength of alcoholism, and they underestimate the power of the program and the steps. 
And, and that's been very, very much my experience. It's a bit black and white for me. I can either, if I do half measure AA, I start to drift away. And when I drift away, I am the kind of guy who will pick up again. And when I pick up, it's awful. Um, or I can practice this program to the absolute best of my ability, do everything that's recommended, and I have this life is amazing. And what blows my mind is how quickly things got better. So I am uh, immensely grateful um, that I made it back. I'm very grateful to be up here, and uh, I think I'll leave it there. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. My name's Gail, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> I'm, I'm grateful to have been asked to share at my, my home group and welcome to any visitors or any newcomers who, who've come to my home group tonight. Um, I first came here a little over 13 and a half years ago when uh, I was in the state that's just been described and absolutely on my knees and didn't know how I was going to live or die and uh, came into these rooms and was told immediately that I suffered from a a disease, a, a fatal malady that would actually kill me. And, um, you know, if, if you're an alcoholic of my type, the type that's described in our basic text of Alcoholics Anonymous, the big book, you know, I, I can assure you that, you know, I was going towards the gates of insanity and death, and, and you don't need to go down that far. But when I got here, I was thinking this morning when I was thinking about the newcomer, did I actually realize, did I actually appreciate that those years ago, that I actually was dying, that I actually could die from this, and it was a disease every bit as lethal as heart disease or cancer or, or you know, something that was really going to take my life away. And I think the answer is no, I didn't. I didn't. I, I had been, uh, like the previous week, I'd been to a GP who told me, you know, right at the end after 30 years of drinking that if I carried on doing what I was doing, um, I was going to reach an irreparable point of no return. And I lied. I lied and said, you know, I didn't drink like that. And uh, you know, the paranoia, the fear around the way I drank, my life at home, to the outside world, you know, people I didn't think really knew what was going on, but my family did. People close to me did. And I got to a point, you know, my last drink wasn't any worse than anything else, but I just had a realization that I had been found out the game was up, it was over, and I couldn't do this anymore. And I had this inner collapse that they talk about in the basic text. I just knew I'd reached, I didn't know the terms at the time, that jumping off point where I could no longer live with or without alcohol. It was killing me, but I could not see how I could possibly live a day without it. I'd got to the point of drink driving, pick up a drink in the morning. You know, other people haven't gone down that far. You don't need to go down that far. But I called into AA and had all the willingness at my command because you, you told me that first night, if I did the things that you'd done, you could guarantee by the promises in that basic text and the promises of your very own recovery that I, I could and would recover. There were no ifs or buts. It was a guarantee. And I wanted it, and it's the first time in my life that I've ever willingly gone to someone and said, help me. Help me, because I really do not know what to do. And I was willing to take actions I did not yet believe in, and it was explained very clearly to me that the only thing that would save me was a spiritual experience. As a result, the result of going through those steps, the only thing that this is about, Alcoholics Anonymous, is working through those steps with a sponsor... And I knew nothing about this, but I'd seen someone. I'd seen someone the way she walked, the way she talked, the way she acted, the way she lived her life. And in this group, I saw old-timers who conducted themselves with dignity and respect, who were heavily involved in, in a life I knew nothing about, and I didn't look like them, and I didn't talk like them, and I didn't feel like them, but I wanted to. And I asked that person if she would show me what she'd done. And for her recovery and having gone through the 12 steps herself, she told me. And I took those suggestions home that night. And the miracle of this program is that after all those years of all the pain and the suffering that I caused everybody else, that allergy that I had to alcohol that constantly, constantly drove me time and time again to take another drink, that phenomenon of craving, that 
nonsense in my head that said after that last spree when I caused chaos and destruction to people I loved, well, it'll be okay next time. It wasn't that bad. And doing it again and again and never understanding why. That night, I went home for the first time with some faith. I went home with, with hope on my, in my heart that this could change because you told me it could. And I got on my knees that night and I thanked God that I've actually had a sober day. And God didn't matter. It didn't matter what that higher power was. But I had to have something outside of me that I could believe in, that I could trust would keep me sober when my sponsor's not there, when you guys aren't there. And I got on my knees and I thanked him because it was a miracle for me that that day I'd been sober. And I wanted to be happy. I didn't want to just be dry. I just didn't want to get through as a drudge. You know, I wanted my life to change. And I was asked to write a gratitude list, you know, things that I'd never been grateful for before, simple things that I got in my life, genuine things that were important. And I started looking at that, to read the basic text every day, to phone to newcomers, start thinking about other people, not me, because I always thought about me. You know, you were doing me wrong, I never did you wrong, and I had the answers, and if you didn't agree, then you've got to be wrong. And actually, I knew nothing when I came in here. I knew nothing about recovery, and you guys did. And I was to get a home group, and I tell you now, if you've hit this home group, it's the best in the world, you know, and I would advise you to come back every week, because it works. It works. There are people in here that have been here since day one, and they've been here for years longer than me, and I wanted that. I wanted that stability and to behave in a different way, to grow up, to change, to be responsible and be the mother and person that I'm meant to be. And I knew nothing about this. When I first came in, I just wanted to stop drinking. I wanted the pain to stop. I wanted the fear, the paranoia, the depression, the whole lot to stop. And that's what I got, you know. And after all those years of drinking, the next morning I felt good. And I knew, I knew something had changed and I knew that I could actually do this if I continued following one person, trusting what they said, didn't argue, didn't disobey, and I willingly gave myself to that. And I came to my home group and I was told to get into service. Didn't know what that was, but saw people sweeping up, making coffee, doing all those things. And the attraction of this group when I first came in was that you all knew what you were doing. You looked good, you were all suited and booted, you had smiles on your faces, you all had something to do, you greeted people. You know, nobody wanted me around when I came in, nobody. You know, I wasn't wanted anywhere. And when I got up in the morning, I was asked to, to pray for a sober day. And I've had those sober days every single day for that period of time over 13 years, you know, and I thank God for it because I humbly admit you know, with, with deep humility, that there's nothing I've done other than follow what I've been, been shown to do because it's not in my nature to do this. It is not my nature to listen to someone telling me when I'm wrong and just shut up and agree because they know better. It's, it's not in my nature, but it's what I do here because that person is more sober than me. My sponsor knows what she's talking about. And the reason she does that is to keep me alive because I want this life. You know, and I, I have had, I've had a miraculous demonstration of a, of a higher power in my life. I've gone through the 12 steps. You know, I've, I've given my life over to the care of God as I understand him. And, you know, slowly and day by day, patiently and persistently, I've tried to change. You know, I will never get it right, but I've tried to be a different person. And for those of you who know me well, you know, the daughter who told me she absolutely hated me, she would never have anything to do with me, she, she couldn't bear to be in the same room with me. You know, she's in my life, both my daughters in my life. You know, I've been blessed with a, a happy marriage, someone I love deeply, and, you know, a job that I could not have imagined. But all these things have to come second to Alcoholics Anonymous because they can go, and Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't need me, but my God, I need Alcoholics Anonymous. And there are times when I still have great ideas, you know, and I phone up Mary and I say, I really, really like to do this, and I've prayed around it, and I've tried to do this, and I've tried to do that. You know, and, and you know, she says to me, you know, God says yes, he says no, and not now. She says, so back off, give him some room, and let him work. He'll tell you if it's the right time. And when I do that, when I stop taking the reins, that resurgence of ego that comes when I think I know, I know best again, then it works. You know, I can, I can allow the day and my life to pan out as it's meant to do, provided I just keep doing this. And, you know, my, 
my joy at this program. You know, I don't jump out of bed every morning, well, hey, you know, another day. Not always, but I know the bottom line is how dare I whinge. How dare I ever look at what I've got today and say that's not enough, it's not good enough. I don't feel great, and so what? You know, trials and tribulations then, everybody's life. When I came in, I was promised that I would have a life beyond my wildest dreams, rocket into a fourth dimension. And as Mike shares, you know, our, our alcoholism is out there in the car park doing press-ups, waiting if we don't do this. And I never want to return to that person. I can't afford to return to that person, but I know to have come from the person who drank the way she did, behaved the way she did, had no, absolutely no chance whatsoever of not picking up that first drink, no matter what promises I made, no matter about the swerves I made, you know, the geographicals I did. I have gone, thanks, I've gone to a place where today it's not, it's not an issue. You know, I, I didn't want to be dry and have to not look at, at booze and think, oh my God, I can't do that. Today. You know, it's as if that problem has been taken away. And it has, by my higher power, provided I keep doing this. Because I've had that spiritual experience. I've had that change of thought and attitude. And I couldn't have told you that that would ever work for me, but I saw people here. People that it really, really worked for. They're still here, those people. And I want what they've got. And I know as long as I keep doing this, I can have it. And my goodness, you know, with what I've been given, I would never throw it away. So if you're new, if you're struggling, if you have doubts, suspend your belief in your thoughts, because this is action. Follow what we've done, and you get what we've got, and you can have a great life. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. My name's Nick. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, I was uh, <coughs> speaking to Little Rich, just because he's still Little Rich to me, before the meeting. And uh, I, remember, I remember the first day Rich came in, and uh, he wanted it. Anyway, I... Uh, <laughs> not like that. And I... <laughs> anyway, I see Rich about every now and again, and, you know, he's clearly on the ball and had a chat with him before the meeting. And he's clearly, you know, he's a guy like me, who is in the grip, still in the grip, a few years later, of a, a powerful spiritual awakening, which is annoying because he, he left and started his own group. It's always sort of vaguely narc when people can do that. But it's clearly that's the case, all right? And uh, so how are you? And so what are you up to? And uh, he said, so how, how are you? And rather than kind of, a, as, rather than taking it as kind of like, what am I up to? Sort of like, how, how are you? So, yeah, you know, spiritual awakening, it's always, I mean, cool. And I mean, but, and, the, and the thing was, I was, I was thinking about it, that when I first, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous over 10 years ago and, and took the 12 steps, I did have a deep and effective spiritual experience. And over 10 years later, I'm still in the grip of that deep, effective, and powerful spiritual awakening. And I've never gone back to the way I was before I took the 12 steps. And so now, no matter you know, what I'm up to, which is what he meant, really, I think, <laughs> no matter what I'm doing, no matter what, is, no, no matter what my, kind of my external circumstances, I'm okay. You know, and, and over the years, jumping forward a little bit here, I've but over the years, that level of being okay and the level of things being on, on the level and the consistency has improved. And my perception has got better and better and better. And really, without being complacent, without being a, a complacent recovered alcoholic, I, I am secure in my sobriety today. And I know that as long as I continue to take the actions I took when I first came in, as long as I continue to take this seriously, that... You know, there, there is no, I never have to go back to the way it used to be. And I still, without, and not a day goes by, not a day goes by that I do not remember, well, I mean, it's obvious, really, because I, I ask God for a sober day every day, but not, and I, and I give thanks for a sober day, but not a day goes by when I'm not walking around, whether it's walking to work or, you know, whatever, just speaking to the guys or, or whatever, not a day goes by. When I don't think, you, God, you jammy so-and-so, you got away with it. You, here you are, sober, a, re, you, you te, a recovered alcoholic. Not a day goes by when I don't 
get goosebumps because I remember vividly, you know, that, the Sunday mornings when I had half a bottle of white lightning left, like 50p left, knowing I wasn't going to get anything for another two weeks, and just, just, no, just, you know, if I had a gun, I'd blow my brains out, just the desperation, knowing I wasn't going to sleep for four days if I didn't have any alcohol, no, just, ah, oh, just the misery, the depression, and yet, and I thought, and I, and I thought that's it. It's game over. All, all my ambition, because I, I had a privileged upbringing, I had all the breaks growing up, and yet there I was, 26, just a, a bum, a loser. And worse than that, a middle-class bum and loser. <laughs> I mean, you know, you still thought, still thought he knew it all, okay? And yet, just as it was then, just, just a year later, you know, I was, I was already, I'd been, I'd been thrust into the realm of the spirit. Once I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and I still get that sense of excitement. And coming to my Friday night, it's like, it's like, I don't want to get it anyone euphoric recall, but it's like when I used to go out on a Saturday night and you'd, you'd be like, you know, be, you know, just getting ready to go out. That's still what it's like for me coming to my Friday night. We, we got a big curry night after this as well, so it's sort of added excitement because there's going to be pain. But, <laughs> but I, I just get it. You know, I still get it on a Friday night. And uh, as I say, not a day goes by when I don't just think, God, you know, you jammy so-and-so. How did you manage it? Because I know that my pain, I mean, my pain felt as bad as it could be. You know, I mean, I, I, I couldn't live life sober. I quickly, dis- and it was, I mean, I really couldn't live life sober. I just didn't, I, was, I, was, I, I didn't seem to be able to cope with things. I couldn't take responsibility. I couldn't just be a friend among my friends. I was just, life was crap. I wanted to impose myself on the world. I was defiant. I was willful. And I quickly discovered that alcohol made me feel better. But I also quickly discovered that I couldn't use alcohol to change how I feel. Because once I start drinking, I can't stop. And then no matter how bad that drink goes, no matter how bad, and it really doesn't matter how bad it gets, I won't be able to stop myself from picking up the first drink again. So, so, and, and, and it just got more and more painful. It progressed. It got worse and worse. And eventually the day came, because I knew about Alcoholics Anonymous. What I was saying is I don't think my pain was necessarily worse. It felt to me like it couldn't get any worse. But I know most people die of alcoholism or go ex- insane. So I'm told. And I've seen people on the streets now in what looks like a lot more pain than I was ever in. And yet I say, look, come on, mate. Come, come to the meeting with me. It's, anything's got to be better than this. Oh, no, Matt. Try your hey, Matt. Don't worry, Matt. I mean, you know, so, I, so their pain looks worse than mine. <laughs> and yet, the, to me, it just seems I, I couldn't take it anymore. And I, I, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I, I gave in. I mean, it took me a few days. It did take me a couple of days to really get step one. To get, but when I heard you guys saying that you know, that I was suffering, if I was an alcoholic of this type, of the type described in the, in the basic text of Alcoholics and Knowledge, that I was suffering from a condition that only a spiritual experience could conquer. I believed you when I sat there in my dressing gown, dripping sweat, reading selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles. I just thought, damn it, all my life I've been wrong, you're right, I've been living wrong all my life. And it was like icebergs or whatever, or ice packs carving into the sea, like, Oh, yeah, poof, I'm real, I'm wrong. And that sense of re- release, uh, real, and it was step one, I got it in spades. And I asked the man to show me he had recovered. And I just gave in. I mean, I was like a blank sheet of paper. And if you're new, you know, my way's not a bad way because I got it. If, you're, if you are new, this can happen quickly as well as be long last. You don't have to hang around. I asked the man to show me how he had recovered. He became a sponsor. He gave some actions to take. And I just jumped in to Alcoholics Anonymous. I just, I just immersed myself in AI. I came in with a great bunch of guys. We were, you know, they were all a little bit more sober than me. And I kind of wanted them to just have a little drink so I could just leap ahead of them a little bit. But it was just that sort of friendly camaraderie, not actually wanting them to die. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, going through the 12 steps and just... Just being rock... I mean, you know, the basic text of Alcoholics Anonymous describes not only my drinking, it describes how I recovered in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was rocketed into the fourth dimension. And my home group, you became my family. And over ten years later, you are my family. You know, I have my... my, I mean, I love you guys. I mean, I've I've been raised up. I've I've become a man in my home group, in this group of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, what more can I say? And, uh, you know, my sponsor started taking me through the 12 steps. And as I went through the steps, I mean, the thing is, I got a sense of awe and wonder pretty much straight away once I got step one. And really, it's all based on step one. Once, once I decided to, you know, to give myself completely to this simple program, give up on all my old ideas, it's been a breeze. I and mean, that is a fact. You know, over 10 years, it's been a breeze. 
But as my sponsor started taking through the 12 steps, the scales really began to fall from my eyes. I really began to understand that I had for all my life, pretty much, for as long as I can remember, been living in that strange world of alcoholism where everything is distorted and exaggerated. I wasn't living in the real world. As I went through the 12 steps and I entered the realm of the spirit, I began to see the world, what it was, which it wasn't that bad. And actually, the world wasn't at fault anyway. It's an inside job. Because the main problem the alcoholic sends in his mind. And I just got it all. And uh, I went through the 12 steps. And I had, as I suspect little Rich over there had, a deep and effective spiritual experience. And it, and, and it still blows my mind to this day that I can walk this world a free man. And I, I live an abundant life. I mean, my family know it. Anyone who knows it, I live an abundant life. I'm doing things today. I'm doing more today than I ever dreamed possible. If I'd written it down on a sheet of paper, before, you know, I, I, would have, I would have sold myself short. But much more than that, I mean, I'm a textbook recovered alcoholic. Everything in the book, it's, it's me. Much more than the... You know, again, the external circumstances that I have found by, you know, trying to practice spiritual principles in all my affairs, and I fail all the time. You know, you know I mean, I, I fail all the time, but through continued sponsorship, continuing to try and carry the message to still suffering alcoholic, continue to try and practice the spiritual principles I've learned through taking the 12 steps, my perception of the world has remained consistent to a degree where I can live comfortably enough to live without drinking and without drinking easily. I do not miss it. As if the problem never existed. And, uh, I mean, if, you know, if, and if you're about to get on board, or if you, if you haven't done it yet, or you think about it, if you're not getting it, you know, don't miss out on, on, on our brand of, of, of recovery, because it will, it will really, it will, it will put a, you know, blow your mind. And, and, and I, I implore you, be fearless and thorough. Tell your sponsor everything, and, um, <laughs> big. Thank you everyone. I'd now like to introduce tonight's final speaker, Tim. My name's Tim and I'm an alcoholic. Um, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to have another moment's silence for all the people that should be in this room and aren't. Thank you. There's a couple of lines jumped out at me from the book today which I want to read. Um, each individual in the personal stories describes in his own language and from his own point of view the way he established his relationship with God. And then a couple of lines later, we believe that it is only by fully disclosing ourselves and our problems that they will be persuaded to say, yeah, I'm one of them too, I must have this thing. And, and it strikes me as odd, really, that I should be standing at a podium talking to a bunch of people on a Friday evening who I imagine have got better things to do than listen to a drunk and a failure. That's what I am left to my own devices. I'm a drunk and a failure. Uh, I've failed in, in every department of my life. Romance, finance, friendships, terrible son, terrible brother, terrible partner, terrible friend, terrible employee, terrible student, and no one was good enough for me. Isn't that funny? Um, uh, and also, I'm not one of those people that came to AA and was a success straight away. Uh, I'm by nature a slipper. Um, not everyone is. Perhaps there might be a few slippers in the room tonight. Um, you know you're a slipper because... You come into a room full of people, smart and jolly, and, and they say, you're going to be all right, and you believe it for about five minutes. And they say, do these things, and you'll be all right. And you do them, and you still want to die. And you say, when is this going to, when is this actually going to start working? And you leave the meet meeting, and you think, well, I'm going to another couple of meetings today, kicking around, kicking around for something to do. 
Um, and I'm the kind of guy who will leave a meeting and uh, go up the road, see a pub, think I could, I could murder a pint. I could just murder a pint. And the memory of all the things that have ever happened to me because of drink uh, don't show up. So, you know, that they say in AA sometimes, perhaps not at this group, but at some groups they'll say, roll the tape forward. Oh, I don't know about you, the thought of a drink occurs to me, I haven't got tape. <laughs> There's nothing to roll forward. If you remember where drink took you, you'll never have to go back there. This isn't a memory problem though, for me. If it was a memory problem, I'd forget other things. But I don't. So it's not a memory problem. Something else going on. So I'm the guy that would get up uh, in the morning, call my sponsor, call a couple of newcomers, read some AA literature on the tube on the way to the meeting, sit through the meeting, listen politely to the chair, Think about what I'm going to say. Say it. Think about what I've just said. Leave the room. Go up the road. Go to the pint. Have a couple of. Go to the pub. Have a couple of pints. Go to the off license. Uh, drink a bottle of spirits. Uh, throw myself in front of a car. It's the kind of thing I do. And I can go to AA as long as I like and attend meetings. And I don't know if today is going to be one of those days. Some days I seem to be able to do what you're asking of me. Very simple things. I'm not stupid. And I was paying attention when I got here. I, some days I could do what you said. You said don't drink and go to meetings and do these other things. But the thing is, I, I was giving myself the instruction don't drink for years before I got here. Just because you're giving me the instruction, don't drink, doesn't make it any easier to follow. I can't follow that instruction. So I'm powerless over alcohol. Um, and when I, so, so, so this is, this is the first, this is the first problem, is that I keep drinking again. A friend, the way a friend of mine describes it, he said, I've got a faulty on button. And you suddenly discover that the on button is being pressed, and you're like, "This was not. The, this was n not today. Not today. Just." And you argue and argue and argue, but you know it's going to happen. Uh, so I've got a faulty on button, which turns on when I don't want it to. Uh, that's one problem. The other problem is I have a faulty off button. And you press it and nothing happens. And you know you're going to carry on until whatever grim conclusion follows. Um, I relapsed uh, after three months at, at one point and uh, was drunk for a year and a half. I, I don't know whether I'm going to come back late this afternoon once they release me from the cells or in a year and a half's time. Well, never. So, um, it amazes me. It amazes me that I haven't had a drink in 18 years. Because I'm not the kind of guy that can not drink for 18 years. It's just, just don't have it in me. Because, uh, apart from this problem of what happens when I've had a drink and the problem of when I'm sober and I end up drinking again, something else wrong with me as well. Uh, it doesn't look like there's something wrong with me. It looks like there's something wrong with the world in every detail. And the best way I can describe uh, what drink does for me is this. Um, you leave me sober to my own devices and... The world looks like a 3D film without the 3D glasses. Everything is blurred, nothing is right, and you can't quite follow it because the just you know it's not supposed to be this way. This cannot have been the way the world is meant to be. 
and you have a drink and it's like putting the 3D glasses on. And I don't know if you've been to a 3D film, but it looks more real than life. It's got an extra edge which life doesn't even have with everything just popping out at you. That's what alcohol did for me. Everything came into focus. Uh, leave me to my own devices without a drink. And I love the three words in the book, so I'm going to use them. Restless, irritable, and discontented. And when I'm restless, I don't want to be here and now. I want to be somewhere else. I don't know where. It's not here. Irritable. Nothing is the way I want it to be. And discontented, nothing is ever enough. And when alcohol worked, where I wanted to be was right here, right now. Everything was just the way it was meant to be. And whatever I had in my life, it was enough. I couldn't work out what my problem was when I... ten minutes before the first drink. Um, if there is one reason why I'm sober today... It's because Alcoholics Anonymous is the delivery system for a sufficient substitute for what alcohol did for me. And it's far more than a sufficient substitute. Um, step two is pretty much a no-brainer for me. I don't need to worry about what or who God is. Because even when I was slipping, I would come to a meeting <laughs> and hear people talk gibberish, either because they were just dumping their uh, woes of the day, which is gibberish, or just repeating little, little slogans, quotes, gibberish as well. And you get to the end, you've heard it 18 times, you know what everyone's going to say. You feel better. You feel fixed at the end of the meeting. Even though you knew what everyone was going to say. It's not new information that's come down the pipes then. Something has happened. Something happens when we're together and you can feel it and you can see it. You see someone coming in and within a couple of weeks, give them a tea commitment and they're smiling. Get them to put a few chairs where they have a purpose for the first time in years. And the lights go on in their, li in their eyes and no one has flicked the switch. It's just happened through us here. So you can see the effects of a power grace in yourself. You can feel the effects of a power grace in yourself. I, I think it's so important for people in AA to tell the truth. Because... Step two hinges on me believing every word you say. If I don't, the whole thing's dead in the water. I've got to believe it. I've got to feel that it's come from your heart. Because if I can identify with what you describe you came in as, and I think I'm like that, how you used to be is how I am today. And I can see in your eyes that you're enjoying life, you are sober, you have peace, power, happiness and a sense of direction. The existence of a power operating in these rooms is undeniable. If I don't identify, I've got a problem. Because I know the power's there for you, but my case is different. And one by one, I went to enough AA meetings that every single excuse was taken away from me. I couldn't, after a while, say that I was different because every element of my story I'd heard I shared once about throwing myself in front of a car and five other people said the same thing. I, could, I had no excuses left. And if I am faced with a crisis, I can't postpone or evade. Step three is a no-brainer too. I don't need to work out how to turn my will and life over to God, which is a relief because if that was your task for the day, I um, still wouldn't know where to begin. But what I can do, what I was promised in Alcoholics Anonymous, is that if I take certain actions, my life and will will be turned over, whether I like it or not. 
with or without my permission, with or without my knowledge, with or without my understanding, I will wake up one day and discover that I'm not primarily concerned with what you think of me and what I think of me and how you treat me and what I want and what I need, which are the elements of self-centeredness. I'm going to discover I care more about whether you live or die than whether I'm having a good day or not. Um, a life turned over to God, uh, I don't think it's anything fancy. I think it's a life that on the outside looks useful. I don't care who you're useful to, whether it's in AA or outside AA, but it's a useful life. And I've found far more satisfaction from usefulness than anything. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to work out uh, who I was. I don't know who I am, I would say. I've forgotten who I am. And then you see these television programs, and people say, you need to find out who you are. I'm not so sure about any of that. I need to find out what my job is. And my experience over the last 18 years is if I can find a job today, if I can find stuff to do for you today, at work, at home, in AA, doesn't matter where it is, I get everything I need, not just roof over my head, food in my stomach, but power, peace, happiness, and a sense of direction. Uh, all I ever wanted, ultimately, was peace. And that's what this program has given me. Um, the most important elements of the program for me uh, are you need to do a step four, you need to do a step five, just tell your secrets to someone else, um, tell someone else the worst parts of your personality. Um, I think secrets will kill you. Um, but there are some other death threats in the big book. There's uh, harboring resentment. It's a big one. Um, and it also talks about not facing our creditors. It says we won't get over drinking until we do our utmost to straighten out the past. It's got these death threats all the way through. Sexual conduct which continues to harm other people. Um, and resting on my laurels. I've got to pay attention to all of these. When I made the final amend, and I think um, the total over my time in AA was about 120, a funny thing happened. All the lights went on, and I realized I'd been living in a grayness my whole life that I hadn't even known was there. I thought I had to accept life on life's terms, like life was this terrible thing you had to put up with. Um, life doesn't make terms. I'd been making terms, trying to make terms with life. Life wasn't having any of it. I need to make amends to everyone for everything I have ever done. And I need to forgive everyone for everything they have ever done. If I've got a problem with anyone for anything, that is a block between me and God. I thought I had to find God. I didn't. I had to remove the blocks between me and God. And the two chief blocks were resentment and unfinished amends. And both of those gave rise to fear. And once you've got all three in place, you're toast. Because only a drink will take the edge off then. Um, this program for me today is step 12. Uh, people talk about doing the work again and going through the work of the first 11 steps. And I'm the kind of guy that has needed to because, as the book says, uh, no one among us has been able to practice anything like perfect adherence to these principles. So however well I do in 10, 11, and 12, stuff builds up. So I've had to go back through the first nine steps again, and the experience is not to be missed. Um, but the purpose is, is not an end in itself. My purpose is to be useful. Um, and life is incredibly simple today. Get up in the morning on awakening. God, please direct my thinking. Because it's only going to run away with itself if I don't ask for that. All I need to know is what am I going to do today and what spirit do I do it in? That is it. Step 10 is sticking to that. Step 11 review at the end of the day, and I then share that with a few other people. Uh, I share my step 11 review with people who are 
15 years sober, if I've got a new guy, um, I get people on to steps 10, 11, and 12 straight away. Uh, if I need that to live, why wouldn't they? How are they supposed to get by until that? So I get them on to 10, 11, 12. And I've got new guys doing step 11 reviews, and I share my step 11 review with them. They share their step 11 review with me so they can see how I'm doing it. I haven't got any secrets. I don't care who knows anything about me. And that is real freedom. Um, the best 15 minutes of my day, my phone, my phone rings a lot. It rang outside here and a guy wanted to speak to me, um, about a sponsor of his. And I felt, I felt more alive than anything. And it's not because I was conveying any great wisdom. I stepped back and something worked through me. Um, that's the good gear. <laughs> um, I never want to leave Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, apart from the fact it's already given me 18 years. Um, apart from the fact it's given me health, happiness, harmony, love, joy, peace and connection, a successful career, successful relationships with my family, with my partner, with my friends, a life where I have fun. It's given me a purpose that I don't see other people outside AA having very often. Occasionally you see it. But I have a purpose, which is to be a channel for you. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. But I'm part of all of you. And that makes me everything. That's all I've got. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.